This is one of a series of recordings made for the permanent records of the Cherokee Historical Society this 13th day of September 1951 in Enid, Oklahoma. Today we are recording the voices of Frank Eaton, Rolla Goodnight, Carve Williams, and their friend Mary Cheney, who has known the boys, all of the boys from way back. Uh, Frank, I think we'll start out with you a little bit here. Uh, how old are you, anyway? 91. That makes you an old-timer, doesn't it? Well, I guess so. Where'd you come from? I was born at Hart in 1865. Well, in 1868, there was a bunch of coyotes called father to the door and shot him down like as if he was a mad dog. Well, in... 70, 72, I was sufficiently drilled that I took their trail. Did you ever find him? I found five of them, but the other fella was at Southwest City, Missouri, and I just got there in time to go to his funeral. He stole a jack off the bottom of the deck in a poker game. That's sudden death, isn't it? <laughs> well, it's, uh, it's just like committing suicide. <laughs> <laughs> what happened to the other four of them? Well, they died of lead poisoning. Oh, they did. Yes. I won't ask you who administered the lead. <laughs> no, but one, the last man was at Albuquerque, New Mexico. And Pat Garrett told me, he says, you ain't got a Chinaman's chance. He says, he's got two of the fastest gunmen in the Lincoln County War in there as a bodyguard. I says, I don't care if he's got the whole United States Army in there. Him and me one will be in a happy hunting ground in the morning. Only I never put it that way. It wasn't good to record, you know, what I put <laughs> in. <Yeah>. So <laughs> uh, he says, well, I don't like a fuss. In town, Pat Garrett told me, well, I says, when you see me saddle old bull eggs and ride down in front of this saloon, I says, and you got anything you can th think of up in the upper end of town, you go up there. Well, Pat was a famous early day sheriff, wasn't yes, he? Yes, see. And I went, went up to the liver stable and paid my bill got on old bull egg and took him down below the door so that if any lead went out through the door of the windows, it wouldn't hit old bull egg, so I might need him to ride fast. Then I just shook both guns loose and went in there. And as I came up to the bar, he says, what is it, kid? He says, what, are, what do you want? I says, I want you, Wiley. Well, when I called his name Wiley, he looked first one way and then the other at these two men. And they didn't show no war wisdom at all. Instead of staying where they was, they come right down and stood right side of him. All three of them was right under my gun. And I didn't have to turn a bit to shoot at any of them. And he says, I don't know you, he says. Well, I says, you don't to. I says, you killed my father and then I ripped out a nose at him, and I says, fill your hand. And that is all that is ever said. They just we done the rest of talking with the smoke wagon. Didn't one of them get you there? Well, I don't know who, who done that. It went in right there and come out there, and I lost one gun. That's in your wrist, isn't it? Yes. Mm -hmm. And as I got up, and I got one here, right in the groin, too. And as I got up, and started for the door. Well, I, first I looked over the counter to see if there was any need to shooting anymore, and there wasn't. <laughs> I'd done a good job. <laughs> I started for the door and run right into Pat Garrett's arm. He says, how bad are you hurt, kid? I said, not so bad, but what I can ride if you help me on my horse. And as he helped me on my horse, he says, you've lost one of your guns. He says, here, take this one. And he pushed the gun in my holster. And he says, now when you get about a mile and a half out of town here, he says, as the road turns off to the right, you'll see a trail there. 
He says, take that and go out there at that house and tell them I sent you. He says, and they will take care of you. I went out there. And that's the way you disposed of all of them. That is the last button on Gabe's coat. <laughs> 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 well, Raleigh, let me talk to you here a minute. Uh, you've been a friend of Frank's here quite a long time, haven't you? About 70 years, I guess. About 70 years. Uh, where were you born, Frank? At uh, Louisville, Kentucky. What year? 69. Uh, I think you told me your folks came out to Kansas when you were pretty young. They come to Texas first. Texas first. And they didn't like it there, and then they come on through to Kansas, or Kansas City. And then uh, tell us about your family there. Uh, well, what uh, happened to you? Well, Dad, uh, Dad took a, had a little ranch out there northeast of our Kansas City, about oh, eight, nine hundred acres, and I worked there with with him. Glad mother died. Mother died there. I was 13 years old. He went over to Missouri, picked out a barn, brought her home. And we didn't we didn't get along. That's your stepmother. That was stepmother. Mm -hmm. She wanted to whip me every day or two, and I didn't like it. <laughs> so I rolled up a bed roll one night and saddled up an old flea bedding pony I had and had a dollar and a half in my pocket. I went down to Arkansas City to Uncle. I had an uncle there, and it was just daylight when I got in there and I was telling him about leaving. He wanted me to go back, make up with them. I said, no, no, I'm quitting. I said, if Dad comes down here looking for me, you tell him you don't know where I am. I don't know whether he ever did or not. I went on down in the strip and uh, crossed the salt fork and uh, went up to Weatherspoon's camp. That's the old Miller, Miller bought him out afterwards. That's the old 101 ranch. 101 ranch. The mm -hmm. old dugout is just about a mile west of the bridge on the uh, Salt Fork. Yeah. Well, I, I asked him if I could have a job, and he said, what can you do? I said, I don't know. Maybe I can't do nothing, but I'll try. Well, he said, I'll, I'll, I'll try you out. So he put me to wrangling horses. He said, get them in by daylight if you can, not later than sun up. Well, I did. I worked out about four months and Frank came along. Then we went, made, went on this trail. That's this handsome man here sitting here you mm -hmm. call Frank. Yeah. Frank Eaton. Yeah, old Frank. <laughs> <laughs> well, how old were you then? Thirteen. And you took up with this old codger at thirteen, huh? Yeah, yeah. Well, where'd, where'd you and Frank go then? We went to Texas. Well, which one of you boys want to tell me about that trip down to Texas now? Well, Frank can tell you that. Frank, what about that trip? Well, we had lots of fun. Well, I reckon. <laughs> 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 we went to our town of city. I come up to Weatherspoon. I had orders. I was an association rider. Uh, uh, what they call now a cattle detective. Yeah. And they wanted men that is good with a gun and nobody to cry for them if they never come back. Well, I filled the bill and didn't have any better sense than to do what I was told. And that is just what they wanted. And I says to Raleigh, I says, let's go to Texas. Well, he says, let me draw my money in the morning. We went up to our kind of city. We bought a dime's worth of salt and 300 rounds of ammunition apiece. And tied the salt on the back of our saddles and lost every bit of it to swim in the Chicago River. <laughs> <laughs> then we had to eat meat straight without any bread or without any salt. And what was it, mostly deer? Deer. Mm -hmm. Well, it didn't pay to shoot anything smaller. There was lots of prairie chickens and deer and antelope, and once in a while there was a buffalo scattered around, but we never chased them, but saved our horses. We had good horses. By the, big, the big herds of buffalo had gone pretty far, yes, much west. Were west. Were they? they were way out west of them. Mm -hmm. But the country was covered with buffalo carcasses. Yeah. The skeletons of buffalo all over the ground. You could see a hundred from any position you wanted to take. Yeah. Well, what killed them all? Well, the buffalo hunters. The buffalo hunters killed them. Yeah, and they slaughtered them, didn't they? Yeah. And then they blamed the Indians. Of course, we'd hang an Indian when we'd catch him stealing a steer to keep him starving to death. But we went and killed their meat, by gosh, just for the hide. Yeah, that's right. And then what did you two young bucks do then after you 
swam in the Shikaski and lost your soul. Why we just done without? <laughs> I just went ahead. We're going down the trail one morning. I looked off way to the west of us and saw a smoke. I says to Dolly, I says, and I believe there's a camper over there. Let's go over there and see if we can't get a biscuit. And we rode over, and there was a wagon a-burning, and a man and a woman and a little yellow-haired girl about eight or nine years old was all butchered up and killed and scalped. Well, we buried them the best we could. The handle was burnt out of the shovel, but we just used it like a grubbing hoe and dug the bank off on top of them, put some rocks on them so the wolves wouldn't bother them. And then we got on our horses and went to riding round and round there to cut sign. After cut what, sign? You, well, I'll find their trail. Find the Tell you, know, you know, they had to leave this center place and go in some direction. Yeah. Well, by riding round and round it, we could see across the trail, you know, and see the sign they made where they left. That's yeah. what we was looking for. Well, we found it. I um, just started out without saying anything. They was going to put me in our direction. We wasn't losing much time. And we felt kind of sore over the way they'd acted with them people back there. And um, long about midnight that night, or a little before midnight maybe, the dipper was way over east of the North Star anyway. Yeah. It must have been a little after midnight. And um, the horses throwed up their head. Uh, we got off the horses and got down to the ground, you know, and skylighted up there, and we saw their horses. Well, we twisted up a bunch of grass and tied our horses to it and let them pick while we went up and cut all their horses loose and tied them all together so that they would bother them a little if they got away from us. The Indians got away from us and got to their horses, they couldn't get away till we could get out there. And then we'd make war medicine with them again, you know. <laughs> yeah. So we slipped up on the camp and kept us slipping. They didn't, nothing bothered at all, you know. We got within 20 steps of camp without awakening anybody. And we laid the rifles down and Raleigh, he nudged me and wanted me to pull his boots off. Because his daddy told him he's going to die with his boots on. He's going to make the old man out a liar, he said. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so I pulled his boots off. And we laid our rifles down and took a pistol in each hand and crawled up a little bit closer. And then we just jumped up on our feet and we just yelled as loud as we could and went on in, just a smoking like a tar kill. And two of them Indians never knew they was dead. The mother Charlie talked to them in the morning. <laughs> and there was two more just raised their head. But this fellow with a little girl's scalp on his belt, he jumped up and we broke both of his legs and we aimed to break his arms and let the wolves finish him. But he fought like thunder and we had to kill him. <laughs> it was dangerous to let him shoot at you that way. <laughs> 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 so we killed him off a whole lot, and then Raleigh put in from there on the morning of picking sandbergs out of his feet with a butcher knife. Then in the morning, we brought their horses in and took and dipped our hands in the blood, in the Indian's blood on the breast and face where they'd been shot got her hands all bloody and then put it on the shoulder of the Indian's horse. That's a death sign. And then we turned the horses loose so they'd go back to the camp and they'd know what happened to them. What tribe Indians was that, Frank? That was the uh, Comanches. Comanches. Mm -hmm. And uh, the ponies, I guess, went back and Raleigh, he was so long picking sandbirds and we had to cook uh, venison again. And we didn't get no biscuit either. <laughs> and then we got that little girl's scalp and buried it. And, but the Indians, we didn't bother about burying them. Coyotes was hungry anyhow. <laughs> and we just left that. 
And you boys continued on down into Texas, did you? Yeah, yeah. we went on down the trail, mm-hmm. across the Red River, went to work for Tom Wagner. John. Old, old Tom old Tom Wagner. John Wagner. Well, uh, One of the boys yeah. runs a hotel there in uh, Fort Worth now, young Tom. Yeah, that's right. They have those quarter horses, too, you know, mm-hmm. Wagner quarter horses. Yeah. Well, Wagner, that was a, quite a famous ranch oh, down there yeah, in those days, wasn't it? spread there. Well, we worked there a while, and Uncle Charlie from up at Poladero, he, he heard we were down there. He sent a man down there after us. Mm-hmm. Well, we went up there then, went working for him. Well, Uncle Charlie you're talking about, he was quite a famous uh, frontiersman out here in those days, wasn't oh, he? Oh, he had. He'd come from Colorado. He first started his ranch in Colorado, and then he moved it down to Poladero. Yeah. And, uh... He had, he had more cattle than I could count in a week. Well, well he's the, uh, more land. He's the famous uh, good night oh, actor yeah. whom the uh, trail out there is oh, named, yeah, right, isn't sure. he? He, 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 he started, started that, that trail. trail. He blazed that trail. Uh, clear through one, one trail went through uh, New Mexico up to Colorado. The other one went to the Doble Walls. And yeah. then went up to Colorado. And the other one branched off of Doble Walls and went to Dodge City, mm-hmm. the market. Well, out of Dobie Walls, that's where they had a famous Indian that's battle out there in the early big, days. big battle out there, you know. Yeah. Well, we rode that... Uh, when Billy Dixon and those boys fought yeah. out there. Yeah. We rode that trail with 3,000 head of cattle <coughs> twice from his ranch to Dodge City. I see. We rode the Chisholm Trail three times from... What's the name of that place across the river there? I don't Oh, well, what river? Well, uh, the Red, Red, Red River. river. Yeah. Well, well, Stone and, Corral. Was. Yeah, that old Stone Corral there. We crossed the river there with yeah. the cattle and come on up the Chisholm Trail to Caldwell. Three, three different trips for yeah. 3,000 head apiece, you know. I see. We had a, Uncle Charlie had a steer, a big old steer. Oh, I don't know. He'd weighed about 12, 1,400. He was seven or eight years old. And he was our lead, lead steer. We put a bell on him, and he'd lead that herd. Hmm. At night, we'd push, get a bunch of heads sticking in the copper, you know, so it wouldn't ring. Yeah. Well, he'd come back up the chuck wagon and eat old bacon rinds and old yeah. biscuits and everything he could get, you know. What'd you call him, Rollo? He old, old Blue. Blue. Old Blue. Old yeah. Blue. Yeah. And we'd go on to Caldwell, and then when we shipped out of there and started back, he went back with the horse herd. He was almost one of the boys, wasn't he? Was he one was. Of the boys, he, he was a better hand than any man on the job. <laughs> How long, what happened to him? He just died he of just old died age. He just died of old age. We just kept him there on the ranch, you know. To we'd net buffalo. Go. We'd catch buffalo calves. Tie him to And him. tie one on each side of him and turn him loose and he'd start take, him for the ranch. He'd take him in. <laughs> he'd look so reproachful at us like as if he was a cussing us out. <laughs> 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 and when, in 1880, Eighty-three, Uncle Charlie Goodnight sold all of his she stuff to the Comanche Cattle Company. Yeah. And we rounded up... That's that, thir- j- that's that jingle bob. Yeah. That jingle we bob rounded up 13,800 cows and heifers. Is that right? Yeah. Well, and me. old Charlie Reese was Deep Smith horse wrangler. Deep Smith received the cattle from Charlie Goodnight, and Uncle Charlie got $6.50 apiece for them cows. That fellow Deaf Smith, that's the guy that that county in Texas is named yeah, after. Mm-hmm. Tell us a little bit about this driving the cattle up the Chisholm Trail here. Uh, well, no, I don't know hardly how I'd go at that. that, that that's something you've got to work out. Something you got to know about or it's you can't tell you it. you got to know about, you yeah. know. But uh, uh, it ain't like the movies, I can tell no, you it about. Nice, it's it's like it's like the movies. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> the worst trouble was is uh, stampedes, you know, something stampeding the herd at night. Yeah. We had to the get them. On, we boy. had to get them on the open ground, you know, every night. If we didn't, why we couldn't ride after night in the dark, you know, and and stop the run. Sometimes, just, sometimes we'd just hit a dry wash, you know, anyhow, fall into it. Well, I've always heard that you strung them out in a line, more or less, and no, kind of had a point I, and a drag and a... Well, it did, yeah, it did on, the, was on, on the, the drive. drive. I was on the drive. On the drive. But at night, them cattle was all, all put in the... I was just a man riding around, and whenever the stampede come, 
I can just tell you a verse of a song that the boys used to sing. What's that? That's lightning rolled in hoops and flashes. Rain and sheet is pouring down. Thunder echoes over the prairie, and the roar of hoofbeats shakes the ground. Top hands ride like liquored engines, begging God for break of day. A stampede beats the best camp meeting when it comes to getting men to pray. <laughs> 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 well, did you ever hear tell Maybe that? we ought to ask you to sing that. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's get on here to uh, Harv here a minute. Uh, Harv, where were you born? 171. Whereabouts? In Illinois, nine miles west of Terry Hood, Indiana, just across the state line into Illinois. When did you come down in this country? Uh, down into Kansas. I come to Wichita in 1885. Wichita, Kansas, with my father. We moved out there in two wagons. And then from there on, we went. he went out to Kiowa County and took had a claim out there by Greensburg. Watson and Fullington had what they call the TWT Ranch, and the settlers had began to take up the land at that time. Had before that, really. And, uh, but they were still taking it up. He gave his riders, he got his riders to file on a lot of that land down on Thompson Creek there, between there and, uh, <laughs> and, and the Medicine River. And uh, then they could get more money for it and they wouldn't turn them over to him. So I had to, I worked for him. I rode horses, broke, broke horses to ride, and I helped brand and done general ranch work there of that kind, riding. And uh, then I range herded 1,700 one summer by myself. Well, you and your dad they brought some horses down into Oklahoma, didn't you? Well, then, after, then, uh, then we put out three crops out there in western Kansas and never raised anything and dried out and the people all left out there and come back to Wichita. Father had a little stoke. That's all that saved him. He had quite a bit of stoke. And he uh, buy horses. And uh, he uh, wasn't much market there for him. We could buy them pretty cheap. So we'd take them. Then the Oklahoma opened up. Him and me made the trip down into Oklahoma. And we got down there, and I tried to get him to take a place, and he said no. He said, the strip's going to open up, and you boys ain't quite old enough to take claim, so we went back. Waited for the strip to open up. In the meantime, he went to was buying these horses, had these horses, and was buying them. And so us me and Brother Bill and Ben Calloway and Charlie Calloway, they would take horses for their daddy. You know, all these people around here didn't know Ben Calloway and Charlie Calloway. And me and Bill would have uh, our father's horses, Squire Williams was his name. And we'd go down into old Oklahoma and sell them to the people down there that needed horses to put out their, their crops on their claims. And then when the strip opened up, we went down to Honeywell and registered. And so uh, the Shkaski, we moved, they got to shooting there in it at Honeywell. And, one another, and we was afraid that the bullets would hit our horses. We camped right there by the saloon, so we moved out west of the town a little ways, about a mile and a half. And uh, I went down that, that night before the 16th to the Shikaski River, and I went, uh, went across it, and there wasn't a bit of water in it. But it had some banks there, and then I followed the North Star straight and went straight north and we draw our wagons up to the line between the Kansas and Oklahoma and we got all our saddle horses got in between them wagons. And when they started to go, there wasn't enough soldiers to guard the entire line, so there wasn't no soldiers where we was. And they got impatient. Everybody had had a watch, was a hole in their watch and a talking and finally I saw the line bend in west of where we was at. There was a high place over towards Caldwell, and I could see it bend. I said, Dad, they're going. He said, no, don't be a sooner, and everybody was a hollering, don't be a sooner. And I said, by God, they're going. And I pulled that old gun, and I 
shot a couple times and you couldn't have held a horse within 30 feet of me. <laughs> <laughs> and then Dad kept telling us not to get excited. Well, he was on old white stockings, one of the fastest horses we ever owned and that most anybody else ever owned. And he took off real southwest and I couldn't call him back. Finally, he seen his herd and he turned and made it into them cattle trails that I discovered down there. And as soon as he struck them, he hollered at us. He says, stop them horses. Don't you run them horses across this sand. Make them walk. We pulled him down to a walk. We walked through the sand. Everybody whipping their horses and just going past us. We walked, he made us walk them up onto the banks of the river on the south side. When we got on top, our horses had their second wind and boy, listen, we run. I went in 23 miles in an hour and 15 minutes. That's you pretty good running. That's good running. You were telling us a while ago something about riding a mule one time, weren't you? Yeah. <laughs> what about that? I didn't hear all well, that. Well, uh, that's, that's when we was trading horses. We down in Oklahoma coming back, we went over to so Osage Nation there, west of Perry and east of Perry and north. And, and then the Indians, we traded it two or three times, me and Brother Bill did, and, and then the Indians would go up and get the, the uh, agent, Indian agent. He'd come down there and he'd make us trade back with them. We'd cheat them, of course, and generally did. And he'd make us trade back, and Dad said, you boys quit trading with them Indians. So it's only Indian wanted these spotted pony, and he had a pretty good pair of mules, and, and Bill, he goes up there and waited till night, and he, he goes up there and gets him to come down, and we traded with him about dark. And we had one saddle, and we started for, for Winfield. And boy, listen, that was the hardest ride of my life. And we'd change off, the one to ride the mule or the saddle, one and the other. And, you know, I never want to take a job like that anymore. And I got up there, though, and there's a lot of gypsies and road traders up there, and you know how it was, Raleigh. And it's that, them whole bottoms was full of gypsies and road traders, and we sold the mules for $75, and we was trying to get 15 for the old potted ponies. So we done all right. <laughs> well, boys, I see this is about all we have time for. Yeah, right. Maybe you'd like to give a big yell or something. <laughs> no! <laughs> no! That's our main <laughs> home. <laughs> Want to shoot? <laughs> I might put a hole up through that ceiling, but then I wouldn't do. Yeah. Let's go. Well, all right. Hey. I guess that's all I would. And to become a part of its permanent records, to record in their own words and voices the individual experiences of many of those who made the run September the 16th, 1893. This recording is by Samuel B. Evans of Enid, Oklahoma. Mr. Evans was born in Johnson County, Missouri, August the 26th, 1868, the son of John L. Evans and Lou M. Morrison Evans. The family moved to Warrensburg in 1878. Hmm. Mr. Evans went with uh, his brother in the drug business in 1886 in Chanute, Kansas. That fall, he went to Northwestern University in Chicago, where he graduated in pharmacy in 1890. He worked in Burlington, Iowa, Memphis, uh, Tennessee, Arkansas City, and other places after graduating from the university. He went to Kingfisher in 1892 and started a drugstore. He uh, made the run into the Cherokee Strip uh, from Hennessy. He opened a drug store in Enid in 1897, uh, which original store was opposite the land office, uh, which, uh, and was on South Grand Street in the 100 block, and uh, was three doors north of the south end of the block. He was married to Ada Smith of Hennessy in 1898, who passed away December the 31st, 1947. His children are Wilfred Evans of Enid and Don Evans of Springfield, Missouri. He is now in business with his two sons in Enid and Springfield as the Evans Cutright Drug Company. Sam, uh, 
You told me that uh, you made the run into the strip from near Hennessy. As I understand it, I think you told me that uh, you had to register up there. That's right. Tell us a little about the registration. Well, the <clears throat> a week before the opening, the government regulation provided that uh, you uh, had to get a booth certificate that you wasn't a Sooner and wouldn't become a Sooner. The booths were established along the uh, strip line, and oh, I don't know, I suppose there's hundreds of them under the supervision of the Army. And uh, I registered uh, a day or two before the day, day of opening. What they do is just give you a little uh, give certificate? Give you a little certificate that I was entitled to end of the strip on the 16th and to take land. Uh, do you remember the day of the opening very well? Very well. It's very vivid. Pretty hot, dusty day, wasn't it? Well, it, it wasn't excessively hot, but it was uh, hot, all right. And there's a lot of disturbance with the horses tramping around and the dust flying. and A disagreeable day in that respect. Were there a lot of people lined up down there where you were? Well, uh, <laughs> there's thousands of them. I don't know how many. Mm -hmm. There was there were people on horseback and people in... Uh, uh, carriages and people in wagons and people in buggies and all kind of conveyances. See any people walking into the strip? No, I didn't. They got run over with the head. <laughs> uh, you made the race on horseback, didn't you? Yeah, one horse. Uh, who came with you? Who was who well, were your buddies? Well, I've forgotten most of them, but I remember W. E. Coggle and uh, and uh, J. B. Ferguson, Lee Gray. And uh, Kirstings, I don't remember, uh -huh. Herman Kirsting. Uh, Cogdell and, uh, Dub and uh, Ferguson were both old-timers here. Oh, they yeah. They grew up in the town until they died. Yeah, they're all gone now, though. Uh -huh. uh, <coughs> Mr. Cogdell, in fact, uh, his widow is living here at the present time, and uh, his daughter is Mrs. Dr. Nielsen. Uh, That's correct. Who lives uh, just to west of Enid here. Yeah. Uh... You and Cogdell were kind of buddies on the thing, weren't you? Oh, yes. We were buddies in Kingfisher before this country opened mm -hmm. and prepared to make the race together. We uh, discussed the thing up and down and sideways, and we first decided we'd have a buckboard with two horses on it. And then later we conceived the idea of having saddle horses to lead. And uh, when we'd made half, about half the distance, we figured we'd uh, have someone along with us, a boy or somebody, and we'd turn the buckboard over to them and uh, take our saddle horses and make the rest of the strip. They'd be fresher. And, uh, but the morning of the race, I got to looking at the crowd, and uh, I figured out that... Uh, we got to thinking what had happened if a wheel on that uh, buckboard had go to the bad and wondering how many vehicles and horses had run over us before we'd get up. And I got jittery about it. So I told Cog I thought it was a dangerous proposition and he said, well, what do you want to do? Well, I says, you give me that gray horse, and you can have the other three horses in the buckboard. And that's the way you made the race. And that was agreed, and that's the way we made the race. Well, I think you told me you started about two miles east of the railroad. Yeah, I figured it's about two miles east where the railroad enters the strip. Had you planned to come to some certain place? You and yes, Mr. Uh, we figured that uh, we could take a lot by a settlement in Enid, and we could take a claim by a settlement or, or by filing. Well, we couldn't do both at the same time, of course. But we intended to run straight into Enid and file blindly. Just take a general lay of the land, land northeast, as we knew something about it, and just take a chance on the quarter that we might file on. You mean just come directly to the land office and come file? Come right to the land office and file on the land, then jump on a lot and mm -hmm. hold that by settlement. Well, your plans misfired a little, didn't they? Misfired. We, instead of uh, bearing a little west, we just went straight north, and we uh, went about where the airport now stands out there. East of Enid? Yeah. 
Was Cogdell with you all the way? No, I didn't see him after the first 20 minutes. Uh, he came in the buckboard, huh? No, he parts the way. Yes, parts the way. He came in the buckboard and then took his saddle horse. Uh-huh. Well, then you uh, went a little east of Enid and uh, kept going north. Yeah, I just kept figuring after I'd been... I figured in 45 minutes I'd be in the side of the railroad or the Landovers, but I couldn't see a thing to the west. So I knew then that I'd born uh, east. At any rate, I hadn't any more than going straight north. And so uh, I started to bearing sharply to the, the left, towards, towards the railroad. And uh, I ran for some time, and I didn't see a soul. I was just, I was just uh, lonesome, as a matter of fact, for the last half hour. Well, you were out in front of everyone then. Yes, there <coughs> wasn't a soul in sight. I could occasionally look over my shoulder to the back a mile or two away, and I could see a few horsemen, but that was all. And uh, so then I was disappointed and mad. I knew I'd passed Enid. But I said to myself, I'm going to go to see the railroad we'll have to run clear to Kansas. Where did you strike the railroad then? Well, I first saw the telegraph line about two miles this side of Kremlin. And I went on into Kremlin, and there was a section gang there and a, and a depot agent, and they naturally thought I was running for that quarter that the town side was on there, or the depot was on. You didn't stop there then, did you? Oh, I stopped, and they all said, stick right here, there hasn't been anybody here, and just you were first, and so forth. I said, well, I don't want this at all. I knew that the town site would, uh, people who crowd in there off those trains, and uh, that uh, they'd have majority, yes, one claim holder. Well, so, I think you told me then you circled down uh, yep, south from there. Then I crossed the track west and started south, and I came back almost to what is known as Diver's Grove. That's where the old country club used yeah. to be, the Doyle Cotton owns that. Yeah, there. I ran almost to that, and that is sanded, and I didn't like the looks of it, and so I concluded I'd wander west a little ways. So I, I don't know how far I went, a mile or so west, and wandered around, and... Uh, I didn't like that country very well, and but the sense turned out very good. So then you went then, back, and uh, then I decided, to, well, if I'm beat, I better get back as near as I can to that railroad station, and so I'll have an easy time getting my place anyway. And uh, so I went back and uh, figured I was about a half a mile from the depot, and stuck my stake. Then after a while, uh, that was then about uh, close to two o'clock, I guess. So I concluded to go over to the section house and get some water. Went over there and first thing I noticed was a, a room from the kitchen. The finest smelling light bread that I had ever smelled. So I didn't know who was there or anything and I went to the back door and I said to the old lady there, I said, Madam, I'm hungry than a dog, starving to death. Have you got anything to eat? She said, y'all, come in, come in. It is the old lady Gummerson, Gus uh, and uh, Bill. Bill Gummerson's mother. So I went in, she cut me off a half a loaf of white, uh, recently baked light bread and a lot of jam and uh, butter and I, what not, I don't remember now, but I just... Ate like a horse there for a half an hour. I'd eat till my jaw played out. And I'd have to rest a while before you eat more. And I kept that up till I guess I was in there an hour anyway. Mm -hmm. Then by that time, the train would come in, had come in from the south and from the north. And uh, they scattered people all over that country. I suppose there was 25 or 30, maybe 40 people located on my quarter out there. Well, you had pretty, pretty good proof you were there first. Yes, I'd stake my flag, and all that uh, <coughs> depot gang had seen me come back and locate, you see. Mm -hmm. Yes, I had that scene. Well, the next few days I came down and filed, and they all left me. You didn't have any contest? No. Mm -hmm. Where'd you spend your first night? I stepped on the bare ground at North Enid. I was up there with a bunch of King Creature people that were waiting for the train. I was due in there at about 12 o'clock. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, there was a car of beer on the track, 
And that was going pretty good. <laughs> the boys liked that, didn't they? <laughs> well. Did you come to Enid the next day? Came down to Enid the next day, and I met Cog down here. He'd gathered up. He, the boys had brought in his bedding and arrived, and and long towards night, so I, we uh, stretched our bedding underneath the guy ropes outside of a big uh, restaurant tent right to the north of where the Coors House stands now. And uh, we got under there and stretched out, and my buddy Cogdell says, gee, isn't this luxurious? <laughs> <laughs> that was your second night in the strip. That was the second night in the strip. Mm -hmm. Up this way. Well. Uh, there was a restaurant tent, I think you told me, on yes, the square at that time. Her name was uh, Mrs. Bandy. And uh, that's... Uh, she was from Kingfisher. Mm -hmm. It was, as a matter of fact, a, a great percentage of the people were from Kingfisher that came in here, the opening. A lot of people that had settled down there to begin with. Huh? Yeah, or temporarily had been around there. Now, you uh, told me that uh, times were pretty tough here to begin with. Oh, well, that, that was 93, and everybody... Not everybody now knows it, but most people remember hearing about the Panic of 93. And it struck uh, that fall pretty strong and kept growing for several years, two or three years. Well, I think you told me you uh, got a job with a drug company about three months <coughs> after the strip opened well, and uh, closed out some drug stores for them. Yeah, C.D. Smith Wholesale Drug Company of St. Joe had to take in a lot of bankrupt stores yeah, and then after that, you worked for Spence Allen yeah, a little bit. six months, and then they come to 97, and that was the first wheat crop we had. That was the first good crop in the yeah. strip, and things picked up from then on, is yeah. that right? Yeah, and I opened up the store. And you opened the store in uh, 1897, Yeah. in the location we said a while ago, and yeah. then you uh, moved up, uh, you know, up farther the up in the block. Yeah, this block. Then you moved to next door to where the Central National Bank now yeah. stands in 1907, and then you moved to where you are now in uh, yeah. 1942. Yeah, that's right. Uh, there was a good many interludes in all this story as far as that yeah. goes, the shifting around, and, but that's the gist of it. I think you told me, too, at one time you had a drug store where the public drug now stands. Yes. Uh, that that was built for yeah. you uh, yeah. by, by Dr. Dr. Champion. Dr. Champion, the yeah. old-time doctor here. Yeah. Well, I see that that's all the time we have time for, Sam, so thank, thank you, you for coming Harry. up. Uh, thank you. Ah, he's going to play it on the radio Tuesday night. This is the seventh in a series of recordings sponsored by the Cherokee Strip Historical Society to preserve in their own words and voices the individual experiences of many of the pioneers of this region. This recording is by Mr. A.D. Reynolds, and is being recorded this 25th day of August, 1951, in Enid, Oklahoma. Mr. Reynolds was born in Andrew County, Missouri, September the 23rd, 1872. His parents were Henry H. Reynolds and Polly Pistole Reynolds. The family moved to Emporia, Kansas in 1884, and then moved to Man's Land in what is now Beaver County, Oklahoma, in 1887. The family made the run into old Oklahoma in 1889 and settled near Kingfisher. They then made the run into the Cherokee Strip September the 16th, 1893. Mr. Reynolds got a home in the run on the southeast quarter of Section 6, Township 22 North, Range 5, which is just east of Enid a little ways. Uh, he lived on this claim for a number of years. He now resides with his sister, Mrs. Norman Bodus, and her husband at 709 East Maple in Enid, Oklahoma. Mr. Reynolds, uh, you told me that uh, you made all of the runs that took place in Oklahoma. Is that right? That's right. As I recall, I think there were five of those runs. I think there were two others that were opened by drawings. Yeah, that's right. Uh, of course, you settled in uh, no man's land. You didn't have to run for that. That was just uh, open territory out there, more or less. That's right. Didn't have much law or anything else in those days. 
Do you remember any interesting experiences out there in no man's land? Of course, you were 18 when you moved away from there. Well, I had uh, a job with a cow outfit, and they told me at the, the night herd that they left me uh, at night with the herd. And if they get up to move and in the rain, why, well, get in front and follow them. Well, I did that, but uh, I wish I hadn't. What's the matter? So the, the further I went, the faster the cattle come, and the horns and heels are hitting, and it just, and it just lightning, I could see a way out, and it's that quick at dark, I couldn't see a wink, and I just kept going about two miles, that herd run me down that, and I stayed stead in front, but... Pertner got run over, huh? <laughs> I just kept a little ways in front. Were those the old longhorn cattle that we yeah. read about? Yes. Mm-hmm. Well, you were punching cattle then in those yeah. days. Uh, you told me something about a vigilante committee that you saw out there at work one time. Yeah. What was that? Well, it was uh, about 30 men on horseback driving the man down the road to foot. And they stopped down there at a big old tree, and I thought I'd go down and see him hanging, but they didn't do it. They just find out afterwards that uh, they merely was trying to get the old man's boys out. They were cow thieves and they wanted to get them. They done that in order to get the uh, boys to come out to f rescue their daddy, but they didn't come. They were going to let the old man hang, huh? <laughs> <laughs> oh, they didn't know that. Yeah. Well, uh, you uh, worked on a ranch, too, a little bit after that, didn't you? Yeah. You told me over by Ponca City or someplace? It's in the Oto country. Uh-huh. The Oto Reservation. What was the name of that ranch? Uh, it the old Rainwater. Rainwater. Rainwater Who? Ranch. Who owned it? Weatherspoon of Texas. Weatherspoons of Texas, yeah. What were you doing, punching cattle over there? No, I was working uh, on the... We were building fences, and I was working for the outfit on and help them build fences, and mm -hmm. at that time, that's when they, about the time the old Oklahoma opened up, and I quit that with it. Yeah. Well, uh, then, uh, old Oklahoma opened in 1889, yeah. and uh, you made the race with your family down in o old Oklahoma. Yeah, I was by then, myself. Uh, hmm? I was by myself. Yeah, but your family settled down there, too. Yeah, oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. And then I think you told me uh, the next race probably that took place was the one you made into the Kickapoo country. Yeah, that's I right. I see, that's over uh, east of Guthrie, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, did you have any interesting experiences in that race? Uh, you were too young to take a claim, weren't you? Yes, I wouldn't take no claim, but I was sitting there waiting for, <laughs> for a cousin of mine to come back. And... Uh, Fellow come along and he said, I'll give you team wagon harness for your farm. And I said, All right, we will do that. And his wife was along and he said, No, I'll not do that. She'll not. Well, another fellow come along and said, I'll give you a horse for your farm. And I said, All right, she's a deal. I didn't have an old farm. I just sat in there waiting for my cousin, you see. <laughs> <laughs> you weren't uh, old enough to have a farm. But I'd better not have had the horse because he's the bulkiest thing you ever saw. Well, maybe both of you made a good trade that day. <laughs> That's right. Uh, you were just making these races for fun, then, is that it? Yeah, mm -hmm. just to be out. Uh, then the next uh, opening after that, as I recall, was the uh, Cheyenne Arapaho country. Yeah, I think so. I think that's right. That's the country. That's the old Oklahoma one, then. yeah. Yeah. That's the country uh, southwest of here. Yeah. And down there east of Kingfisher. and Cheyenne Rapids. I mean, west of Kingfisher. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you... Well, you weren't old enough then, were you, to no. take a farm? No. What'd you make that race for? Just for fun. <laughs> <laughs> Did you stake any place in that run? Yeah, I stopped. Stayed all night. Nobody come to buy me out, and I'll come back home. <laughs> you just staked one and couldn't sell it, so you came on home, <laughs> yeah, huh? That's right. Well, let's see, that was, uh, that was in about 1890 or 92, as I, about 92, I believe that race was. Was it three, two or three? No, the strip was in three, and that was in two. Oh, yes, right. Then, of course, the next one, and the last one, and the biggest one was the Cherokee. Yeah. 
Cherokee Strip. Mm -hmm. That's a big race. Yeah. Now, you told me that uh, you started from uh, down near Hennessy. That's right. Where you're, and you had three brothers, you told me, that, yeah. and your father that also ran in that race. Yeah. Did you all run together? Yeah, started together. Uh -huh. How were you, on horseback? Or? Horseback. All of you? Everyone had a horse. <clears throat> that was a pretty hot, uh, dusty day, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. They'd uh, burn the country off, you know, the soldiers had, and it just, oh, it was pitiful. What did they burn that country before the race, to keep uh, any fires from starting? I suppose, to keep from burning people up. Well, uh, did you stake a place that day? That day, yeah. That's the place we mentioned up here yeah, before. that's it. Uh-huh. And, uh, did your brothers get a place? Yeah, all of them. Where were they? Well, a brother got to one south of my place, and one brother north of my place. And the older brother, he got two miles north of that yet. Uh-huh. Did your father get a place that day? No. What was the matter? <laughs> he got on school land. Oh, he made a mistake and got yeah. on school land, huh? He couldn't read the numbers as good as you boys, is that it? No. Well, uh, where'd you spend your first night now after you... Out here at this bridge on 64. Ain't that 64 going east? Yeah. Right there, just south of that bridge. Uh, which bridge is that? You mean... Uh, Across the skeleton. At the end of the University Boulevard here? Right near town? No, out on skeleton. Way oh, down. on skeleton, yeah, on out... Uh, that's out not too far from the present airport, is it? No, just this side, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, who was with you that first night? My father. You found him during the day, yeah, did you? Yeah, I found him and mm -hmm. bedded him down. I see. Anything interesting happened that night or the next day? I slept with a rattlesnake, that's something. Well, that's exciting at least. <laughs> yes, yeah. yeah. I outrun him though the next morning. <laughs> Yeah. What'd you do, wake up and find him in your bed or something? No, I just rolled over and he began to sing to me, you know. Yeah. He's right there. Boy, he began to rattle and I began to go. How yeah. fast do you think you were moving when oh, you got through? <laughs> I've beaten all the records of the ever foot, foot race. You beat all the records, didn't yeah. you? Yeah. <laughs> Seriously, nobody... I expect so. Uh, what uh, were the first improvements you put on your place out there? A little building. House? About, yeah, house. Uh -huh. and, uh, about 10 by 12. Was it a frame or a sod? Frame. Frame. Mm -hmm. How long did that stay there? I don't know. I went back home to Kingfisher and come back the next morning, and or next uh, spring, and it's gone. I don't know who got it. Somebody Some, take it. Somebody needed it worse than you, huh? <laughs> yeah. yeah, he take it away that winter. Uh, now, you had, you made all of the runs, and I think you told me that also one of your brothers uh, got a lot in a drawing when, when they opened up the Kiowa Comanche country. No, he got a farm. Oh, got a farm? Yeah. Uh-huh. Down at close to Apache he located. Well, you and your family just about did all of the land in Oklahoma then, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, we had a lot of it for a while. Yes, sir. Still got some. Uh, you were telling me a while ago uh, that uh, when you were down at Kingfisher that uh, you worked for the Daltons no. for, for a while. Yeah. You mean that's the family of famous outlaws that we read yeah, about and see in the movies? That's them. That's them. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Uh, you said uh, they had a place out well, there. Where was it? It is south, no, it is north and east of Kingfisher on the creek. How far do you reckon? Oh, I think it possibly three or four miles down the Kingfisher Creek. Northeast or north, northwest? Northeast. Mm -hmm. Over toward the Cimarron. Well, what they have out there? Just a regular farm? Yeah, they had a ranch there of all kinds. And I was working for them, and the, the boys would come in there at all times in the night and daytime. 
I did suppose there was cow punchers, like a lot of people was. Well, who was living there on the place? The oldest boy, Ben, and the old lady and two girls. Their mother, huh? Yeah, their mother. Two sisters? Two sisters. <clears throat> What'd you do for them out there? Well, I've done some farming and uh, done some farming and uh, all just a roustabout, you know, mm -hmm. like you thought I would be on a place, do most anything. Well, did the boys do anything out of the way when they were out there? No. The marshal ever come out to get them or anything? No. Not while I was there. Well, let's see now. It seems to me like there was Bob and Emmett and uh, Ben and Bill. Was that all of them? Gret. Gret, yeah. And they were all the members of the Dalton gang, weren't yeah. they? Yeah. Yeah. They bring any other tough characters in there with them? Well, I knew what they'd call uh, Three Fingered Jack. Uh, funny name. Three Fingered Jack. Yeah. And uh, that's about the only one that the and the boys had in there. Yeah. Well, I think Bill got killed a little later, didn't he? Yeah, he was killed down in Chickasha, South Chickasha. You were telling me uh, an experience uh, that you saw there in Kingfisher one day when when yeah. you were in town with Bill. Yeah. Tell me about that. Well, it was just uh, uh, standing there on the corner after I'd left Bill, he went on home, I reckon. Well, I was standing there and the fellow come up to a man and he said, uh, let me have a dollar. And he said, hell, I ain't got no money to give away. And he just took out a six shooter and killed him. Right there in front of wow. me. Well, they run to the, his mom got right, right quick, you know, and run to the store and there's no rope in the first hardware store. And by that time, the United States Marshal had this fellow on a dray, found a mule. And they run to this, the crowd run to this next store, and uh, they finally got a rope. But the United States Marshal jumped up in the seat and just whipped down mules and broke away from the fellows trying to hold them till they got there. Yeah. And so he saved him, huh? Yeah, and run him down to soldier camp and... You were telling me about the time Bill went in the saloon there, the marshal was standing on the yeah. street. He, uh, <coughs> he went in the... <laughs> oh, he said, if he wants me, let him get me. So he went on then, and he, uh, old Bill went out, and then there's another place I guess you had reference to is in regards to uh, Let Dalton. And I and Randy Bill went into a place, and the bartender, he said, uh, Dalton, I told you never come to my place of business. And he jumped up on the counter and jumped over and just kicked him from out on the sidewalk. So Randy Bill got pretty mad and he said, Dalton, don't speak to me no more. Because let a man kick you all over town and do nothing. Well, I don't want you to speak to me. <laughs> So, uh, of course, we know that uh, Dalton would have been arrested. Uh, he'd take anything that would be arrested. Yeah, he didn't want to be caught. That's no. the reason he took that. Well, I see our time's up, Mr. Reynolds, right. and thank you very much. That's all right. That's good. That's I mean, good. These interviews of the old-timers in the Cherokee Strip are being taken this 16th day of September, 1953, the 60th anniversary of the run into the Cherokee Outlet. We have with us at the present time two distinguished gentlemen who had just come down here from Caldwell where they attended a celebration in that city. They're Mr. Ross Hume and Mr. Harry Bybee, both now of Anadarko, Oklahoma. I'm going to talk first with Mr. Hume because I went to school and graduated in the same law class with his son, Ross Hume, Jr. Uh, Mr. Hume, uh, I understand that you made the run into the strip. Yes, I went with my grandfather a half mile over the line, second tier of quarters. Where from, near Caldwell? Just about a half mile west of the railroad, south of Caldwell. Well, you weren't quite old enough to take a claim, were you? No, I was only 15 then. Did your uncle get a claim? 